Hello and welcome to the 11th episode of Always Take Notes. In this episode, Simon speaks to Tom Jennings, who is the director of the Logan Nonfiction Program at the Carey Institute for Global Good. Very worthy sounding title. Simon spent three or four weeks, months, years there <laughs> earlier this year um, uh, at a delightful sounding residency which involved um, snowshoes and, 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 and ice, ice fishing. Yeah, ice fishing as well. So I, yeah, I had a fantastic time in upstate New York at the Cary Institute earlier this year working on my book. And at the end, I sat down with Tom Jennings, who's the director of the nonfiction program, also a very distinguished filmmaker and academic at NYU. And we spoke about the Institute and also what uh, places like that allow uh, writers to achieve and um, why they're generally a good thing. Which is something I find really fascinating. I've never done a um, a residency of that kind and you're very good, much better than I am, than winkling out all the um, the grants and the residencies that are available um, for, for writers and uh, understanding why we should apply for them. So they're a good thing, but we don't want, obviously, too many people to apply for them because it diminish our own chances. But we hope you enjoy the episode. Well, listen, Tom, thanks firstly so much for finding some time on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I'm here at the uh, Carey Institute for Global Good in upstate New York with Tom Jennings, who's the uh, director of the Logan Nonfiction Programme, where I've had the great privilege to be for the last uh, month or so. Um, Tom, could you talk a little bit first of all about what the programme is and, and what its origin is, uh, particularly given it's quite a recent uh, setup? The Logan Nonfiction Program was established two years ago. It's a very young program. It's a residency fellowship for nonfiction writers and documentary filmmakers. And the idea was um, established by a former resident of another artist colony called Yaddo, which is it's a famous artist colony in the United States, not too far from here in upstate New York. But that's a, a broad-based uh, community that allows filmmakers, poets, painters, and what the former Yada resident, whose name is Tim Weiner, uh, thought when he visited here was that this would, this institute would be a wonderful place to house people in residency for extended periods, uh, nonfiction journalists who are uh, in need of a place to concentrate solely on the work at hand. And out of that inspiration, he worked with uh, another guy named Josh uh, Friedman and Carol Ash, who run the Cary, and together they established the what was then called the Cary Nonfiction Program and subsequently has been renamed the Logan Nonfiction Program because of a, a million-dollar um, grant that we were given by the Logan Family Foundation just this past year. Sure, thanks. And and how did you get involved yourself in this? I'm a documentary filmmaker, and so uh, I'm ceaselessly fascinated by the writing process. I am a writer, too, uh, but I write scripts. And uh, the continuum of writing, you know, whatever medium, is the thing that fascinates me. And my uh, coincidental relationship was based on my having a house nearby, actually. Uh, and and then them having a need for a director and sure. me wanting to uh, to help out and the the passion that I've developed for the program comes from the fellows themselves people like you um, the walks that we take the talks that we have um, the work that comes out of this is just uh, uh, astounding and I don't I'm not one for you know superlatives using a lot of uh, great descriptions of of great work and I I find these people though uh, an amazing lot and um from each person i'm i'm learning things and so it has turned into a passion project for me sure and you you have a, a parallel role at nyu as well um how do you find the the kind of residency environment compared to the university environment interesting question um well, I think that the university environment, when I, when I teach, I teach graduate and undergraduate students, there's um, a sense of urgency that's based on the academic calendar. Mm. And it's also based on um, deadlines and uh, projects that are forced upon the students. Mm. So while there are plenty of students who are uniquely talented and rise above and become you know, uh, their projects are, are as important as, as the departments that they're in. You don't really find that the 
the the individual investment is there as you find here because people come here with a very specific project it's something that they've been working on for a long time they've invested countless hours um and you know they're living on the edge oftentimes you know people who are these are this residency tends to attract individuals who are not staff you know of magazines or or publishing houses these are people who are individuals who are out on their own and you know, jumping from one rock to the next. And, but they take their project wherever they go. Mm. And that's the, thing, that's the thing that's most fascinating is you have these experts coming in and they're passionate, passionate, passionate about what they're doing. And the primary difference with the university is that they have um, the power and resiliency to focus intently on their project and usually get a lot of work done here because of it. Yeah, I mean, I've found I've, got, I've been able to get an astonishing amount of stuff done here, partly through being in just a very beautiful environment, but also just able to set up a, like a great rhythm, you know, doing yoga in the afternoon, taking a walk. Like being, being in an environment like this has been, has been really magical for me. I mean, do you, do you have you know, a particular idea that you hope people will achieve here or, or, or a particular objective, as it were? No, you know, we don't. I mean, that's the thing is like if, you, if I don't personally and institutionally, we don't. Yeah. We're just we're just thrilled that people come here and, uh, you know, set out to, to do something. And to be honest, not everybody does. Mm. I mean, some people come here and it's not that they hit writer's block. It's that they suddenly are uh, removed from the project. Mm. They're so subjectively, you know, involved in their project in the field at home and then they come here and there's a vast sometimes oceans literally oceans of distance between them their project and then like you yeah uh and it changes the perspective and suddenly there's a they freeze for maybe a few days or maybe weeks and suddenly there's a moment there's is that moment that walk in the woods that gust of wind that hits them and suddenly cha- it changes or maybe the communal aspect working with you know, socializing with other writers, it often, you know, jars something loose. I mean, what I found is I, I came here with a, like a very discreet task in hand. So this was to to write and deliver the fourth of six sections of my book. And I felt that having, you know, in the three that I'd done before, I'd moved from really kind of working my way through the process, not knowing how long it was going to take and all of that. And that had sort of smoothed out. So I knew I was I was relatively comfortable with you know, the time that I needed to get it done, what I needed to get done. But it, I, ha- I have had that feeling, particularly for me, of, of a feeling of like, I see the way through the woods now, literally, in terms of like where I need to get to the end of this. And also, in, you know, I had an interesting conversation with Josh, who's also involved here, his idea that, that often a nonfiction book is a compromise, you know, that people mm. go into it and there's so much work involved and, and that at some point their ambitions tail. And what I feel really positive about is coming out of here and thinking, I can see a way to the end of my project without without compromising actually that you know it's obviously it won't it won't be infinite and that move from infinite ambition and and uncertain form to um you know actually a more defined route which i think is part of any big project that will take place but i feel i feel i can see the way i want to do this and and it's just been really really magical to have that i mean how do you see fitting into the broader kind of journalistic economic climate with magazines and newspapers and the way this work is produced and the way this work is is supported how do you see the the institute and the program fitting into that well um i i feel fairly strongly that we're a pretty good deal for the publishing industry Mm. (laughs) because people come (laughs) here and they finish their books and um those those deadlines that always uh, seem to be pushed off by authors mm. in the process oftentimes actually get completed here. Yeah. And uh, we're young and we're too young to really have a huge track record of that. But I have heard from various publishing people that they're very thankful that we're here, that their their clients, their their writers are actually working hard here. There is a focusing element to it. So there's a bonus that they get. Um, I think the same is true with uh, the magazine world. There, there are several. I don't think there's a person who comes here. That's not true. There are authors who come here strictly for books, but mm-hmm. a large percentage of the fellows come here with projects in hand because they're freelancers, uh, independent, that they have to make a living and they're finishing work. Mm-hmm. They have, they have, you know, strings that they have to to attend, and 
And so there's a lot of uh, magazine work that gets done here too, a lot of articles that get done. Yeah, I've been, I've been doing that as well. And just so that to people listening know, um, if you're accepted here on the program, there's, there's no fee involved uh, or it's all, it's all free if you're accepted. And um, Tom, just, just so we're all clear on this, how is it funded and supported from, from your side? We um, got an original foundational support grant of $100,000 from the Knight Foundation. Uh, the Knight Foundation in the States here is a, is a journalism foundation mm. uh, based in Miami um, that does a lot of work with uh, uh, journalism and investigative journalism. And the, um, but the, the biggest grant and the, the one that's sustaining and has given us a new sense of purpose in life, really, is the Logan Family Foundation. Mm-hmm. And they're based in Berkeley, California. Okay. And they're focused largely on investigative reporting. Um, however you want to term that. I mean, some people want to say investigative reporting is just reporting. It's what we do. We investigate. If we're not investigating, what are we doing as reporters? But there's um, John Logan, who heads that, has a very uh, a very deep well of, of interest and passion in journalism, well-written accountability journalism, investigative journalism that really questions uh, the basic rudiments of, you know, uh, whether it's uh, corporate greed or uh, governmental uh, ineptitude, uh, he's he's there and willing to support it. And he's fascinated by the writing process. Uh, and as a rare person, he as a rare person who funds journalism, he understands how difficult it is to write. Mm. And he discovered us through uh, Josh Friedman and Tim Weiner, uh, and hooked into it and became a passionate, I use that term a lot, too much. I, I would say he became a, a very active supporter of the fellowship residency, knowing that people need a place to concentrate, to sit down and focus and write. And what's unusual about it, actually, is that, um, you know, you don't see the results for a long time. And in the foundation world, in the United States anyhow, there's this notion of impact. They want to know what the results are. They want to see the eyeballs, they want the numbers of eyeballs. They want to see, you know, legislation changed. They want to see crimes or criminal, you know, cases conducted based on investigations on journalism that they fund. And what John understands is that as an as independent journalists, we can do a lot as reporters and writers. We can change things and mm. elucidate things and provide a big magnifying lens on the world, but um, it takes time and he's willing to support it. So it's great. Yeah. But can we talk a bit about just the surroundings up here? I mean, for me, and I think for a lot of the other fellows, a lot of the real magic of being here has has been the environment. So the Institute, uh, Rensselaerville, the town, broader upstate New York. Mm. Certainly for me, coming, coming from the UK where our winters are damp and, and wet, it's been just magic to be up here in the snow. I was talking to my editor in London about it's like being in Narnia. Um, but, you know, could you describe a little bit this area and where it sort of fits in culturally in the US? <laughs> well, upstate New York is, is, you know, New York was one of the original colonies. And... Um, New York itself was founded by the Dutch, mm. of course, and um, we all know about New York uh, as being, you know, New Amsterdam, now New York. Uh, but um, there was a huge swath of land north of New York at the same time uh, that the Dutch had settled too, mm. and they divided it up into what were called patroons. And Rensselaerville was one of those central patroons. This town of Rensselaerville was a focal point for. Um, the upstate New York area that the Dutch held back in the 1600s and 1700s. And so it has a long history. And the architecture is you know, reflective of that. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I love most about up here uh, that I think you would you know, empathize with are the stone walls. Yeah. We have lots of stone walls here. And, and they, dry, dry stone walls as well, without mortar. Without yeah. mortar. They're just they're piled onto. They, we have a lot of slate up here. Mm. And those walls have been around for hundreds of years, and they were property property dividers. Mm-hmm. Um, but now they're – and they still do that. They still function that way. But um, it's a, it's an amazing facet of the up upstate experience, especially around this mm-hmm. part of the country. And um, it just harkens back to our deep history here. 
And um, the architecture, the landscape is reflective of an agricultural society that, you know, existed up here, a dairy farming society that existed up here, a culture yeah. that that has been relatively untouched, um, even though, you know, here we are in the 21st century. It's fairly distinctive still, culturally distinctive, I'd say. And just, just to, to paint a picture of it, there's a, this is a, there's a big old house at the center of the institute and a number of, of more modern buildings. Just in terms of, you know, what, what are you specifically looking for in, in applicants here and people who are, who are applying on the program? We're looking for people who are deeply invested in one project and have a track record of experience that doesn't have to be vast but has to have a certain progression that's leading up to the, this project that they're working on now. Um, and we prefer having, you know, long-term project, long-form projects, mm -hmm. books, or long-form investigate, uh, let me scratch investigative, long-form <laughs> nonfiction articles. Mm -hmm. I say investigate because that's where I come from, and yeah. I, I'm predisposed to that. But uh, what I love, actually, what I've been fascinated and encouraged by is the uh, the breadth of applicants, mm -hmm. the number of people who apply, you know, not with the expected notion of just doing war uh, combat mm -hmm. journalism. We get a lot of that, and we support that. We have several people here who are writing about that mm -hmm. now, and but including you, <laughs> and. Uh, but we have a, we also open it up to people who are kind of odd, idiosyncratic, mm. uh, yet you know have a strong, steep, or steeply involved in their or are involved steeply in the in the particular project. Like one person now, Joanne. Mm. Joe is is an amazing New Zealand writer who has is doing a book on. Do you, you're from yeah on you, on a couple of uh, TV chefs right from, you you know from, them though right uh, I'm, I didn't I didn't know them I think it was slightly before my time okay uh, Hudson and Hall yeah or there was Peter Hudson and I can't remember Hall's name but yeah. New Zealand chefs who who started on television in New Zealand and moved to London mm -hmm. and became in the Commonwealth he was extremely famous and kind of pioneers of you know gender politics yeah. and so this was a very strange and fascinating topic that didn't conform to what we normally get. And I love, as the director, bringing those unexpected kind of gems into this into this setting. Yeah, because yeah, I was going to, going to ask, how, how broad is the, the remit for the kind of nonfiction people are working on here? Um, there's no remit. There's no remit. Okay. <laughs> no, I would say that there's, there's just a, you know, what's good? What's fascinating? What really gets your attention? I mean... I won't use you because we're talking about yeah. you all this time, but you know your project was interesting because it was so unusual. We were not going to get another project like that, yeah. and you had this you know vast experience of independent writing behind you too, and then you're just a good writer. And we look, we pay really close attention on the quality of writing that we get, yeah. and I think it's reflected in the fellows who do come here. They tend to be really serious, very good writers, and um, you know, strongly focused on a goal, and there's no requirement to be an American citizen no. as well. We should no, we should we're we've we've accepted fellows from around the world. Yeah, and what about career stage? I mean, what I found really interesting here is is you know, the, the, I think the cohort and why it's it's such a creative, fulfilling group is there's people at you know different stages of life and different stages of projects as well. How do you go about kind of working working that one? It's a stage process only in, in, in the sense that we're learning. You know, we, we don't have any defined characteristics of any individual cohort, a term I hate, but it's, it's, it's um, you know, diversity is, is an overused word a lot now, yeah. too. But the thing that's so fascinating about bringing a diverse lot of people in, it's not just about ethnic and gender diversity. It's about subject matter diversity. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking for people who will throw us anything that's interesting. It doesn't have to be any, any one particular project. And as far as where they come from, where they are in their career, it is across the spectrum. We have, you know, people who are younger than you. You're, mm -hmm. you're a very young person, but mm -hmm. you're also uh, not the youngest person here. Yep. And we have people who are, you know, kind of who are veteran. We have Adrian LeBlanc here. Yeah. Adrian LeBlanc is, 
is is a, a titan yeah. in non-fiction, non, non-fiction literary journalism. I should say for anyone in, in the UK not familiar, she uh, is an American writer who, who won a MacArthur Award, which is um, one of these so-called genius grants, uh, and wrote a book called, is it Random Family? Random uh, Family. Yeah. If you haven't read Random Family, it's it's... It's one of those things that you actually have to read if you're a nonfiction writer. Yeah, you yeah. have to. I mean, what what I'd found really wonderful this as well is you know it's an extremely distinguished group of people here. I mean, she's not the only person with a MacArthur grant in this small group. But what I'd found really positive actually was that there's no ego in this environment that I'd found, and actually that particularly the experience we've had of um, we're doing salons or reading other people's work, I found has been has been fantastic and in some ways slightly different to when I've done some of that in a university context because how, how so because there was just i think no everyone seemed to have checked their ego at the door you mm. know in here which i found um i found was really really fantastic and and very useful in that way i mean maybe we could talk a little bit about you know the kind of routine that's set up here with 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 salons and with feedback and stuff like that what how how that works and what that's aiming to again achieve. we're again we find ourselves being a work in progress but i think what we've decided to do <clears throat> Is make suggestions, yeah. but we don't put any kind of strictures on the group, um, and we hope that they find their kind of, you know, their own organic, say, tempo, mm. and um, and each each class has a, a distinct character to it, and sometimes it's very very involved. I think you guys are actually very involved as a group, mm. and there are these salons, and we don't schedule the salons. We start the this term off you know, we bring everybody together at once mm. and we say this is what's happened before if you want to do it you know you have to organize it but and that tends to be enough of a stimulus to get people to do that and those those group experiences tend to be very important and identifying as you know in, in you know in retrospect later on these are the moments that people really do remember. Yeah. Those salons <laughs> tend to be those, oh, remember that. Oh, remember when that happened, that salon. And it's uh, it's fascinating to see how, you know, one passage, one word, one phrase, one turn will encourage an amazing amount of discussion and change the nature, change a person's direction, a writing direction. And they're very important. They tend to be very important, but we don't, we don't, uh, we don't force that on anybody. The one thing that we do try to bring in our writing workshops mm. and so uh, we'll have a writing uh, master class and we'll have you know very experienced writer come in for a couple days and offer uh, a group experience where people provide their writing uh, to the group they they show themselves it's a it's a it's a bearing process. Mm. It's an opening process that I think some people find difficult to share their writing publicly. And then it, it, it's, it's torn, not torn apart, but dissected and, and used as exam- examples for, you know, how can you turn this to that, how, you know. And so these are also really great things that are, I think, uh, powerful uh, tools and and the person, well, you you saw this. The person who came in was Mark this, Kramer. Was yeah. Mark Kramer, mm. who's renowned as a writing instructor, and as a writer himself. And um, and I think that several people were found it very illuminating. I don't know if you did. Yeah, definitely. And and I found certainly what you said about this this bearing, this mm. revealing exposure. I I definitely felt that. I read at a workshop actually at the first salon, and um, and I felt it was you know it's an intimidating thing to do, particularly in in front of a group like this but the environment was very supportive and I actually felt you know this was a necessary stage actually you know to bring your work into the public to like bring it out you know it, it, it precedes publication but I think I, I drew a lot of really useful feedback from that and also the movement from an act that is is solitary in many ways writing to to doing it in a group it's different dynamic yeah I mean when you when you read your work out loud yeah. not in your room by yourself but you when you read it out loud to a group it's a yeah. very different process and it changes your perception and your perspective yeah. on how you're going to take that forward yeah 
Um, in terms of the, the walks, one thing I was I, I, I really enjoyed it was um, you know, the walk we took on a on a chill afternoon through the maple woods. But um, your your interest in having walks rather than sit down meetings, where does that come from? Oh gosh, I think uh, it comes from it comes from childhood. Just that's when my most productive moments are, and sure. and the most intimate moments I've had, I think, are on walks. And and this is a a beautiful environment to go out and explore. And I think for me, it's um, it gets to that kind of notion that's very you know rooted in Western civiliz- civilization about the journey. You know, there's always a journey in it. And as a documentary producer, I'm always trying to make things happen. You know, I want to make an experience happen. And so I find that instead of sitting down and talking uh, in an office or even at a table, you know, over food, uh, the journey, getting tripped up and falling in streams and testing the ice on the pond and, you know, falling into snowbanks and for us, I think it was avoiding a snowplow. Coming we, we, had to, we had to avoid a snowplow and make sure the dogs avoided yeah. a snowplow as well. We had dogs with us. And, and so, you know, that's a journey. Yeah. And it's a powerful process, even even unto itself, even if it's an hour, two-hour, you know, moment. It's not – it's something that really changes things with him. And can you, for perhaps people who are thinking about applying, are you able to give an indication of what number of applicants are applying or, or what the what the prospects are like, as it were? Um no, I mean it's it's just been growing yeah. each time. So let's see. I think in your class we had a hundred applicants. Okay. And we for, sp- for what about ten, twelve? Ten places. or twelve places. Yeah. And uh, and before that we got. Um, I think we started out with you know a very when we started <laughs> we were very we were concerned. It was testing. It was is that pond? really frozen or not you know yeah. is the ice thick or not and uh we didn't know um but now two years two and a half years into it uh there's an incremental uh, growth and it's actually a fairly significant one and so i think we might have started out with 20 applicants now we're at 100 and so i we've just launched uh, we just put out the uh, uh the note to the press release you know asking for applicants for the fall 2017 and I expect we'll get, you know, even more on probably like 120 or 130, 40, I, yeah. I suppose, if, it, if that kind of trajectory continues. But um, it gets harder. Yeah, it definitely gets harder. And, and the submission materials, I'm just trying to remember when I did it, it was a section of text and references. References, and... Uh, a piece of your work. Um, you know, bits of information. Do you have a publication contract? Yeah. Do you have an? You know, we, we don't ask if you have an agent. We ask if you have a contract, um, but that's not a limiting factor if yeah. you don't. Um, we ask, uh, yes, for references. And then what we do, we have had a staged process where we get the applications in, and then if we need more information, we contact you. And then we ask you for, say, the first chapter of your book. Hmm. And, um, or maybe another reference, because sometimes we get references like their agent will write <laughs> on behalf, and that's not a good reference for us. We need, you know, somebody who's independent, who doesn't have self interest involved, too. Yeah. And, but yeah, the, the, the kind of the, the real test is the, the long chapter that tends yeah. to be the one that shakes people out a little bit. Okay. And um, we touched on this earlier, but this idea of how do you how do you steer in the environment here between giving people freedom and creating a sort of accountability as it were or a or a framework for for what they're doing. Mm. <laughs> well, it's an interesting question and I laugh only because I don't believe I don't buy the second part of it. You don't buy it. Okay. I don't think so. Do we do we demand accountability no 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 not almost i mean nothing nothing formal at all um and i think that's that's wonderful it's the correct approach um, but i mean it's not it's not that we just are just you know we do want you to do work yeah and and people do work i mean well, that's the yeah. thing is that there's something that happens here and yeah. i'm not sure what it is but it's not us saying you will do this yeah. and like i i've told plenty of people on those walks Look, you don't have to write today. You know, that's yeah. not you don't have to do that. You don't have to write this week. It, yeah. You know, if if you do, that's great, but you know, you're here to to find the muse if nothing else. And 
So there's no accountability, really. I think, though, at the end of the day, there's a self-enforced accountability that you – that's probably what's coming – where your question is coming yeah. from, like, how did that happen? Yeah, it's sort of, it's like the magic of a long leash, right? Yeah. That you, you know, you, you people, because as you say, it's not, it's not the term paper, right? It's your no. book. And, and I think for a lot of people here, it's something that they've been working on, you know, for years. And it is. And we don't, I'm not asking you for your pages. I'm no. not, I mean, it happens that some fellows want us to read their work, mm. but we don't demand to see your work. What I've also found very positive um, is that there doesn't appear to be a kind of competitive atmosphere here. Someone mentioned they'd been on another writing fellowship where people would, you know, ask at breakfast how much you'd written that day or oh, anything. And none God. of, none, <laughs> yeah, it sounds <laughs> awful, right? Um, none, none of that has has surfaced here. And it's been, uh, it's been relaxed, but it seems, all, yeah, there's a kind of alchemy that happens of place of mm-hmm. people. Um, I suppose the final element would be the food, which has been spectacular, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And, and part of that, could you talk a little bit about the, the, the food? The food, yeah. And maybe the well, brewery. There's, the a, brewery, there's the brewery. a certain caloric content that you need to survive, and we provide it. I mean, that's basically, <laughs> we don't I think, want I people think starve. I think you're putting yourself down here. The food is, is it's been <laughs> astonishing. It's been excellent. Well, um, you know, I've heard that, and um, and I think the food is good here. And I think what's what's good about that is that the the uh, or where that comes from is that. The people who are making the food actually really care about about the people who are eating their food, and they want it to be a good experience. And yeah. um, it's not a it's not a Michelin star restaurant, but on the other hand, you can get you know your eggs cooked any way you want in the morning, yeah, and, or not. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there's actually just I mean it's a small thing, but that just that dynamic at breakfast with the the guys in the kitchen and the fellows is is really magic actually because right. it's like why is that? It's just not it's not. A restaurant demeanor. You know, everyone knows everyone. Everyone knows No, their well, name. see, that's the thing um, is that it, we're so small that, yeah, you know Tim and you yeah. know Patrick and you know, yeah. and everybody is, yeah. And it's almost, it all, I mean, this is maybe speeches, but it almost seems like they're kind of doing their art and we're doing ours. You know, yeah. the food is no, like, true. is like the, the like thing. That. Um, yeah, I'm just, um, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been a really, really magic experience and there's a brewery on site as well. We have our own brewery. <laughs> yeah, how many writing programs have their own brewery we'll talk about the last like last night what happened last so night? there was a there was a, a, a five course beer and food pairing event that w- there was not just for us it should be said it was for the broader Rensselaerville community but right. a number of a number of the writers went along um there's an extraordinary guy who runs the brewery who's a real aficionado greg, greg. greg is he looks like what a beer meister should look he does. like a brewmeister yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and served served this sort of spectacular spectacular feast. I mean, it's maybe also worth saying again for, for British people that this is it's quite an isolated environment up here. But you know, without without a car, you're sort of in in the, the sticks. So it does become a like a very tight um, tight group of people. Did you did you find that on previous classes as well? That it became people yeah. became pretty yeah we pretty it, intimate. Really. It has it has uh, encouraged I, what I th- I think will be you know bonds that last quite a while. But they're it's interesting too because again, when I became a direct the director, mm-hmm. what I noticed immediately was I I came in when um, the second class had was underway, and there was not that connection, and that was primarily because we had staggered the acceptance, and people uh-huh. came in, you know, one or two weeks after each other, and and it really upended that kind of connectivity. And that was clearly the first thing to change or get back to. The first class was very tightly knit. Mm. And then the second class, your class, actually you're the third class to be technical about, but uh, you you guys you're the you guys are very tight. Mm. And um there is the the um there's something about that that happens not every time but it's not forced. It's just maybe the schedule does it. Yeah, I mean, I just I just still think really about the day I arrived, which is kind of magic. I you know I lived in the states for eighteen months in my early twenties. I hadn't been back for eight years. Flew to New York, got the train up from the city, like really jet lagged. Taxi up here through the snow and and just sort of walked into a restaurant and felt incredibly welcome immediately from. Oh, from that's the right. Gecko. You came late. Yeah, I did. I, I turned up late. Yeah, right, right. You walked in with your yes. With, with, your, your luggage was like thrown on the. Yeah, like the, the dining room snow floor. still on my boots. Um, yeah. But I think I, we should we should wrap this. But the, I mean, the broader thing that I really cherished about being here is, is, is in many ways just feeling valued for your work. You know that what and and yourself because I think often 
perhaps particularly in the UK where we don't have this this established tradition of of long format nonfiction writing in the same way that mm. the US does, that it can be thought to be a, a kind of curious activity to be doing and and just a very you know just to be kind of valued and say like it's okay and you know and you can you can pursue this and it's and it's all right you can be a freak yeah you can you can do that i felt i found that's really special and you know thanks for thanks for having me here really now a quick update from us simon what have you been up to um i have been uh doing a variety of things i'm wrapping uh the edit on this piece for Outside for Scotland and uh, doing the first draft of a a big story I'm doing for Bleacher Report in the States uh, with other bits of book stuff and then going off uh, for a couple of weeks which will be um, really looking forward to that. Cassia, what about you? I um, have finished um, a couple of chapters that were giving me serious jip and I now feel um, more energised to um, crack on with the rest of the book and uh, I have also taken the Society of Authors um advice they've been running a yoga for authors program recently and i have um taken that as a as a, an excuse to get back into doing nourishing author related <laughs> um, yoga of the mornings uh basically to get me out of bed and, and out of the pit of despair of, of writing in the final few chapters <laughs> so all good all is good and we should say astonishingly we're not actually in cassia's shed today because it has yet to be wired for light but uh, <laughs> in o- sound. A, a, <laughs> only a matter of time and we will return to that thank you for listening this has been always take notes hosted as ever by simon acom that's me and cassia sinclair me obviously our producers are olivia crellin ed kiernan and liz davies our music is by jessica danheiser Our social media is handled by Zara Hankir and James Edgar does our graphic design. And naturally, we are on all manner of social media. You can find us on Facebook and on Instagram at uh, Always Take Notes and also on Twitter at Take Notes Always. And our website is alwaystakenotes.com. And finally, if you've enjoyed the show, please do leave a review on iTunes. It really helps. Thank you very much. Bye.